It's 11.59 at Radio Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. I have a joke for you. Government in this town is excellent and uses your tax dollars efficiently. <laughs> 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 the the moment you see it coming. The moment you see it coming. Bitcoin is immune from attack or almost completely. With Bitcoin, you actually gain far more from using that computing power to generate Bitcoin. System approaching perfection. Just in time for a disappearance. There's a system approaching perfection. Just in time for a disappearance. We'll walk deeper into the belly of the beast. If it means I'm able to further limit reckless government spending. I mean, I have so many ideas. Some are simple, like take down traffic lights and eliminate the post office. The bigger ones will be tougher, like bring all of this crumbling to the ground. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the Crypto Show, a show dedicated to understanding the promise of currency, technology, and anarchy in the pursuit of a free society. And if you believe like we do that such a society can and should exist, then join us, why don't you, as we parade through a world unbound by convention, a world sketched by the beauty of the human artist. Because each and every one of you listening right now is that artist. So for the next two hours, let go of your most sacred system of thought and entertain the possibility that maybe, just maybe, everything we've been told about currency, technology, and yes, even oh, <laughs> even that dirty, dirty little word anarchy is only one part of an ever-expanding, ever-possible complex universe of ideas, one that we simply refuse to explore so what do you say, listeners? Let's do some universe exploring tonight and have some fun while we do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, my dear listeners, was no sound effect. That was actually one of our guests who's here tonight in studio with us. Very excited to introduce him here in a moment. And uh, the problem that he's having, I believe, is uh, there was some mosquitoes with the West Nile virus up in Williamson County, and I believe he may have been bitten by one of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's not just his voice either. He's uh, he's developed all these uh, rashes all over his body, and, like, he keeps asking for brains, and he's really pale. And uh, I don't know. Brains. It's kind of... <laughs> that is awesome. I almost, man, I, I almost cued you in right after I said crypto show the first time to do, oh, yeah, I wish I had done that. That would have been a cool little addition. But, uh pfft. We'll uh, we'll do that throughout the show. I like that. We should do Danny for uh, let's talk Bitcoin. We should have him do the magic word later. Okay. <laughs> See if anyone can decipher it. So for those who don't know, including our guests, for uh, let's talk Bitcoin, the internet network about well Bitcoin. Uh, each episode uh, of each podcast that they have on, someone's supposed to do a magic word sort of towards the end, but we try to mix it up and do it a little more randomly. Uh, and I, what, what did they get? LTB coin. Yeah, they right? get. They actually get paid to listen, and that's uh, proof proof of listenership. Proof of listenership. Yeah. Exactly. Um, they're, they're, they're their own minds, sort of. Uh, yeah, but, that's, or that's actually. Rather. Yeah, that's how they mine the coin is by uh, the people producing the shows and putting it on there. They're paid, and then uh, the people that listen, uh, they enter the magic words, and they're paid. And this creates the crypto. Which in turn uh, creates a currency to pay for advertising and such on their network and, and whatever else. Yeah, it's a really brilliant system. I mean, that's just the beauty of uh, of Bitcoin and the blockchain and all the technologies that kind of emanate from it. And of course, let's talk Bitcoin would not be possible uh, without the lead singer of Maroon Five, uh, Adam Levine. <laughs> Sorry, no, Adam B. Levine, a different person, the creator of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Great guy, really, really smart guy. And uh, 
we are uh, very much uh, obliged to uh, finally have joined that network at the beginning, beginning of this month. So uh, we're going to have a couple of guests on tonight. One is a returning guest, Ladar Levison, the creator of Lava Bits, the encrypted email uh, service uh, that was famously used by Edward Snowden and was famously uh, asked by the government. Basically, the government approached him and wanted to uh, sift through all of the, the emails on his service. Uh, and uh, instead, of, instead of specifically singling out, you know, keywords or uh, individual people, they wanted, you know, the whole shebang. And he refused sort of uh, uh, John Galt style. And there's a whole story behind that that he shared with us on a previous episode. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, just to give some background, uh, especially for listeners who don't know. And uh, we'll see what he's up to these days. And we also have Cliff Baltzley, uh, the founder of Hushmail, uh, a similar uh, service. And uh, Cliff, uh, as I said, as we mentioned, has a little case of uh, the sniffles. Oh, it is. <laughs> kind of affecting his, his voice there. So, uh, so bear with him there. Anyway, uh, we do need to also mention uh, our lineup of sponsors in other upcoming things our sponsors as always brave new books 1904 guadalupe for all your suppressed information and premium health food products such as tangy tangerine and all of the longevity line as well as bark superfood also hill country home improvements and logos radio network without whom this show would not be possible if you're listening in on one of the podcasts available at logos radio network.com let's talk bitcoin lrn.fm or bitcoin talk radio those are brought to you by rule of law.com so if you have legal issues or you just want to know what your lawyer should be doing check out rule of law radio.com if you're listening to one of the podcast versions be sure to follow us on twitter and facebook so you'll know who our next guests are that way you can participate live through our call-in number at 512-646-1984 on wednesdays and sunday nights 8 to 10 p.m central standard time all of our sponsors have links or discounts at the crypto so just click through from there to find the best deals and to keep up with upcoming events and there you have it. To keep up with upcoming events. Events. I it think should it, have been plural. Yeah. It shut off. There should little. be an S there. Did it <laughs> shut off or did your brain shut off, Danny? A little of both. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, well, well, we only have one event, so. That's true. Well, and speaking of events real quick, I should add that uh, at Brave New Books this Saturday, October 31st, that's Halloween, uh, we are going to have the zombie ball. I think it's the like eighth annual zombie ball or something. Jim Mars, best New York Times bestselling author, will be there, and he will be judging the costume contest. Uh, I' not exactly sure what it. I mean, I've heard five different related things. It's either a general costume contest, or it's like your favorite New World Order person, or your favorite I don't know conspiracy theorist or something, or maybe your favorite uh, politician. Probably if you do any of that. You know, uh, it'll be cool. People will like it. But Jim Mars is actually judging uh, for best costume, or he's one of the judges. So that's pretty cool, too. I don't know what the prizes are, but they're probably pretty neat. So go to BraveNewBookstore.com, and you can go to the events page and learn more about that. And you can cool also. Cool story, bro. Don't forget uh, the BitcoinBookstore.com, the sister site of BraveNewBookstore.com, where you can get over 50 titles uh 50 bitcoin titles uh pretty cool stuff um so are we gonna have ladar on in the second segment i guess yes okay well i guess in the in the five minutes we have uh remaining in this segment uh we have cliff baltzley as i mentioned founder of Hushmail, uh with a, a little bit of some vocal issues but that's okay uh, we'll, we'll bear with him but cliff how are you this evening doing real well chris thank you <laughs> Despite being under the weather, that's good. Oh, yeah. Being a privacy nut is a full-time job. <laughs> well, and uh, it, it certainly is. And honestly, I respect uh, the extent to which you go to preserve your privacy. I honestly wish I did more for myself because I'm very much aware of uh, how much governments and corporations are able to get your information and hackers and how easy it can be. Uh, and all it takes is a little piece of biometric information or one time of your social security number being out there. Uh, I guess real quick, um, yeah. uh, tell us why it's so important to you. 
Well, I've been a computer programmer since oh, over 30 years ago, and I, I realized very quickly how databases are going to be the end of privacy as we know it. Um, and, and that's happened in my lifetime even more so than I'd feared. Wow. And so was there, and, and if I don't want to probe too deeply, of course, because, you know, obviously along with privacy is, is only uh, saying so much about yourself and your reasons for privacy, but was there a particular uh, personal incident or was there something you saw in the news or was there a particular technological development? You did just say, uh, you know, databases uh, uh, and servers being the end of it, but was there anything else that really got you down that road? No, there's really no particular event or anything that did it. It's just uh, once you understand how a computer works and where it was going to go, this is, you know, 15 years before the World Wide Web, you, you're, it's, it's an inevitable conclusion. And um, I think we're seeing it right now. Right. Well, and, and let me ask you, too, and... Um, you know, if we have time left in this segment and, and certainly on the other side of the break, we'll get into more of your background and we'll get into Hushmail. We'll introduce Ladar. But, um, you know, you're, you know what, what I love about the show is Danny and I are not experts, but we uh, are able to get uh, some excellent experts like yourself on uh, who also happen to be just great down-to-earth people with some vocal irregularities. But... Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, we try to get, get as far as we can in our understanding of, of the technical side. But, you know, obviously there's a lot of important uh, defensive weaponry out there in the fight for one's privacy and, and security on, uh, online. But, you know, when you see stuff like uh, SSL encryption and the, uh, what was it, Heartbleed bug, where they basically uh, discovered that there was sort of a backdoor to that. Uh, system that you know two thirds of the internet was using for their uh, w website security, and it, then it turned out that the NSA w had been exploiting it. You know, uh, is it? Should we always still be skeptical, even when someone offers us solutions? You should always be skeptical unless the source code from what you're running on your machine down to the chips that implemented are not fully disclosed to the entire public. That was uh, well said and uh, brilliant, and I, you know, that just sums it up right there. And in fact, what it reminds me of, we had William Binney, uh, the former technical director of the NSA, on, and he was a very interesting guy. And he said something similar. Uh, he basically said that the NSA and other government agencies um, had put in, uh, you know, backdoors. Or had infiltrated uh, even down to you know the microchips of the hardware of various electronic devices, not even simply uh, computers, and uh, and it, it's scary. But you're right. So uh, take it from the expert and, and let you know. There's different levels of trust you can have. Obviously, uh, you know there there are groups out there, there are uh, uh, individuals, corporations, and uh, third party testing groups that are probably reputable, and you know. A, a reasonable person without a lot of technical background probably trusts them, but you never know for sure. And like you said, unless you know it down to the nitty gritty uh, on every level of abstraction on the hardware and software side, uh, you can just never be sure. I think that's a great point. Um, well, we're coming to break with uh, Cliff uh, Baltzley, and uh, we're going to have Ladar Levison on the other side. And this is the Crypto Show here on this lovely October 28th, 2015 here on Logos Radio Network. So stay tuned, guys. We'll be right back. Don't worry, folks. If you missed the latest episodes of the Crypto Show, you can always catch the replays on Tuesdays and Fridays on BitcoinTalkRadio.com, as well as the latest news in the Bitcoin space. That's BitcoinTalkRadio.com. Or just find them on the TuneIn app. Logos Radio Network. Logos Radio Network. Dot com. What? This is what happens when you call the cops. Say what? This is what happens when you call the cops. Come on. This is what happens when you call the cops. You get your rights violated or you all get shot. Pow. This is what happens when you call the cops. Uh. This is what happens when you call the cops. What? This is what happens when you call the cops. You get your rights violated or you all get shot. I'm 
think of people being victimized by criminal cops. Psychopathic predators terrorizing neighborhood blocks. Equipped with pepper spray, mace, cuffs, tasers, and glocks. They like serial killers acting out subliminal thoughts. Forget what you taught. These cops have got a license to kill. Witness intimidation means that they can use it at will. Code of silence means that the pigs will never let out a squeal. And if they go to court, they know the judge will make them a deal. For real. That's why they stopping me, locking me up. I kept waiting for the, this is what happens to call the cops. I was going to, you know, riff off that. Yeah. And then uh, it just didn't arrive. I guess I timed that one. Does it? Is the timing always the same on the intro songs? Well, let's see. Oh, yeah. Apparently it is. <laughs> well, in that first uh, little musical note you heard was Rob Hustle of RobHustle.com. This is what happens when you call the cops. In that second, uh, Barry White-like uh, voice <laughs> was uh, Cliff Baltzley, another entertainer. Uh, here in the studio with us. More than an entertainer, though, uh, uh, a software engineer, computer scientist going back a long time, and uh, we're very glad to have him here in studio with us. Uh, we also have on the line uh, Ladar Levison, the creator of Lava Bits. Ladar, how are you? I'm good. Uh, thank you for having me on the air once again. No, we're very pleased to have you back on. Uh, we had a really good time with you uh, many months ago, uh, when you were on uh, the first time, uh, there, it's, it's so fascinating hearing about uh, the history of Lava Bit and your involvement with it in the courts and just how crazy the court system is and the government and their spying. And uh, we're going to you know, talk to you over the course of the show and find out what you're up to these days. We'll also uh, get into a little bit of a review of Lava Bit uh, for listeners who may not have heard that previous episode. Uh, but first, I'm going to have... Uh, uh, Cliff Baltzley introduced himself. We were talking to him earlier. Didn't really get much of an introduction. And then uh, Ladar, I'm going to have you introduce yourself, and then we'll kind of trade off talking about Hushmill and Lava Bit. Uh, so, Cliff, um, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, um, I've been into computers since uh, before I was a teenager, and I probably would have gone into video games if it were the I realized just how important cryptography is going to be to the world. Um, I uh, uh, ended up uh, into the startup world pretty early into my early 20s and um, did a company here in Austin called Ultimate Privacy. Uh, that was, it was uh, interesting. Um, I, and that was what preceded Hushmill, right? Yes, that, that's, that's where I learned how uh, a startup or also encryption system startups really work. Um, I won't go into the details, but I think within a year, um, we had a significant interest from the CIA and wow. quite a few other things. Um, <laughs> And was this was this email related? Uh, yes, it was. Okay. Yes. And yeah. and just what? I mean, again, you don't have to go into detail, but can you tell us why they had this interest? Or is well, it? Well, uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. Uh, it was based on one-time pad cryptography. We had specialized hardware to generate truly random numbers, and we would send two CDs out to a purchaser so that they could hand that exceedingly long private key or symmetric key to who they were communicating with. Um, it's it's provably unbreakable. We had a $1 million bond for wow. anyone who could break that. I think we're the only company to ever have that at the time. It was uh, up at the MCC building at the Austin Technology Incubator. And, you know, I was 25 and getting into all of that. And that's what preceded Hushmail. And you, ta you said you were 25 then. You said you were into computers before you were a teen. Did you have this deep voice before you were a teen as well? Was <laughs> yeah, this, or did this hit with puberty? Or years later. And then it hit the deep voice. So what can you do? <laughs> right, exactly. Well, uh, we're going <laughs> to... It's just, it's physiological, guys. Okay, just, you know, don't don't make fun. Yeah, this is a lot of fun, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, you know, it's really interesting uh, talking about uh, your previous company and how the CIA had pretty quick interest. I guess, you know, they've got their feelers out everywhere. And if there's anything that could endanger their sort of full-spectrum dominance of uh, information in the World Wide Web, uh, they're going to they're gonna be looking to uh, to to 
to take it over or shut it down or God knows what. Well, um, we're going to talk to you in a second again about uh, Hushmail, but let's get Ladar a chance to introduce himself. And uh, Ladar, uh, of course, uh, give us a little bit about your background. Well, first, every time Cliff talks, I keep thinking, you know, if something happened to Steve, the guy who voices the Master Chief in Halo, you know, Cliff could just strap <laughs> on his voice modulator and step in. Given that the new Halo game came out yesterday, I figure it's quite apropos. Well, uh, you, but I was you heard how he likes – go ahead. Well, I was going to ask Cliff. Uh, he said he started with computers at a very young age. What was your first computer? Uh, Commodore Vic 20. I uh, created a video game that I had to delete all the instructions so that it would fit. It was basically a Tron Life Cycle two-player game. I uh, I skipped the Commodore. My the first computer I really got to play around with was a Packard Bell 386 SX. Oh, yeah. with oh, yeah. one megabyte of RAM and a 40 megabyte hard drive. <laughs> oh, wow. I ended up learning more about computers because eventually Doom came out and I wanted to play Doom on what at that time was an antiquated computer because the 486s had already come out. So I learned how to, you know, manipulate my config sys and my auto exec bat and mm -hmm. it just sort of grew from there. Uh, I started mm -hmm. going to, to DEF CONs and learning all sorts of interesting things. Yeah, I went to DEFCON 3 and DEFCON 6, and I'll also say Doom was a great video game. In fact, it's the Amen. last video game that I've played actively because I'll get so addicted to that stuff. Hey, can, you, can you say use the force real quick? Just use the force, Luke. <laughs> oh, for a second, I thought that was... I thought that was like a T-Rex from Jurassic Park, but no, that was Chewbacca. <laughs> that was you know. But yeah, uh, that was the last game he played, but he did do the voice uh, voiceover for uh, for Halo. So that's why you, you made that connection, Ladar, is that was actually Cliff. So uh, interesting. A lot of side projects. <laughs> he did have a lot of side projects, apparently. I don't, I don't want to know about the rest, but... Wasn't so not to get too sidetracked, but wasn't there an early computer? Uh, maybe it was an Apple one. Maybe it wasn't that sold for like hundred thousand dollars. Someone had it in mint condition. Was it a Commodore? Was no, it one of the? I, I think that was one of the early Apple ones. Was it one of the early Apple? It was ones? an Apple uh, one. It yeah, was an Apple but... one that uh, somebody found, like an aunt found in her attic, and had no idea what it was, and took it to a consignment shop. And they figured out what it was and sold it for 100k. Oh my god, man! I wish I I gotta call my aunt and see have her clear out her attic. Well, <laughs> well, Ladar. Anyway, um, but yeah, continue. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, how you got into to what you're doing and your background. Uh, well, like Cliff, uh, I also was at DefCon three, and I think my interest in computers has just sort of grown from there over the last 20 years. Uh, it was one of these situations where I got to college and I, I started studying computer science and I realized I already know all of this stuff. Um, so when I graduated, I went out into the real world and, and again, like Cliff, uh, did the startup thing. I don't think I've ever worked for a company uh, that has more than a hundred people. And I've worked as a <laughs> consultant for a large brand, but I was always employed by the little guy. Um, you know, the people who care more about what you can do than what your job title is. And I just, I ended up, in the email business, kind of by accident, um, I was a systems engineer back in 2004, and I owned NerdShack.com, and I was looking for something cool to do with it. And at the time, there were two business models for the Internet. Um, you either create software that generates content and then make money off advertising, or you hire a bunch of people and pay them to create content. And since I wasn't a very good writer, but I was a halfway decent uh, software developer, I figured I'd go the former, and, you know, lo and behold, Gmail gets announced April 1st, 2004, and I'm sitting around with my friends and thinking, hey, I can just take some open source software, throw it on a computer, buy some, you know, large hard drives at, at CompUSA, and I can compete with Gmail, and it turned out that it wasn't quite as easy as I had envisioned. Uh, I, I'm sure Cliff knows this, but the, the thing about email is that it's but particularly with the open source software that's available, it's a relatively easy thing to do when all of your users fit on one server. Right. Uh, but when you need to start scaling those systems, it becomes very, very difficult. So 
I quickly uh, decided to write my own mail server, and uh, <laughs> it it wasn't nearly as easy as I thought it would be. But as I was going through the process of writing that server, uh, we started hearing these reports about this mysterious plaintiff. Um, out of New York that was suing. Well, that sounds interesting. Sorry, Ladar. We're coming to break, but we'll talk more with Ladar and Cliff on the other side. Stay tuned to The Crypto Show. Help support The Crypto Show and save yourself some dough with purse.io. Hey, that rhymes. But seriously, folks, go to thecryptoshow.com, click on the banner ad for purse.io, and sign up today to start saving 20% and more on products at amazon.com. Plus, check out our perks and coupons page for other great deals like 10% off for Anarchapulco. Use coupon code CRYPTO. Not to mention dozens of great deals on Bitcoin swag and apparel on our free Ross page. All proceeds going to freeross.org. So go check out thecryptoshow.com today. Live free speech radio, logosradionetwork.com. What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader or will you follow? Are you a fighter or will you cower? It's our time. Tip back the power. What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader or will you follow? Are you a fighter or will you cower? It's our time. Tip back the power. What you gonna do when they show up in black suits on your street and I'm mid boots? I never know the lyrics of that song. <laughs> Welcome back to the Crypto Show, guys, here on this lovely October 28th, 2015. I can't quite do it. It's just not the same. 2015. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. And that's Cliff Baltzley, the founder of Hushmail. And we're also going to be talking alongside with his experience at Hushmail and what that's all about, uh, some new projects he's working on. We've also got uh, Ladar Levison on. He is the uh, founder of LavaBit, and uh, he's got some new uh, stuff he's working on, too, and we'll talk about that. Uh, in the meantime, b- before we were interrupted by the break, Ladar was just kind of giving, uh, for new listeners, a little bit of his background. And Ladar, you basically uh, had done some work at startups, done some consulting for uh, some of the big boys. You decided to open up your own email uh, service, and uh, go ahead and uh, continue with that. So, yeah, I wanted to go head-to-head with Gmail, and, you know, the thing I never really liked about Gmail was the fact that they profile your messages for advertising purposes, so I figure I'll just deliver randomly generated ads. So, you know, the business sort of started with a privacy focus, and if we go back to 2004, we'll remember there were all those headlines, which we now know were related to Calix and Nick Merrill uh, suing for the right to disclose a national security letter. And I saw those, and I saw the the provisions in them uh, regarding secrecy, and I had this sudden realization that I'm running a service that at some point will probably become subject to one of these letters, and I was afraid that I would have to choose between defending the Constitution or complying with the law. And knowing myself, that means probably going to jail because I would defend the Constitution. So I... uh, put on my engineering cap and learned everything I could about cryptography. And that's sort of what prompted me to build uh, the server side crypto system. And I've been fighting to defend user privacy and email privacy ever since. And we applaud you for that. And uh, hopefully we can get into that story a little bit here uh, shortly, but real quick, since you mentioned it, what was in that letter, the, the statement or statements that uh, made you think that your company would fall under that? Well, um, as an Internet service provider, you sit in a very privileged position. Um, You know, your users trust you with incredibly personal aspects of their daily lives, whether it's um, a broadband provider or an email service provider or any one of these other services that have sprung up. You have access to user information. Anybody who's ever been a system administrator 
and had to go in and troubleshoot problems on other people's systems and look at other people's data realizes how much you can learn by looking at somebody's digital fingerprints. And I just sort of projected out what would I want a service provider to do with my data, and I built um, LavaBit based on that premise. I wouldn't want my service providers turning over my information without my permission, let alone doing it without notifying me. Um, so, you know, that's sort of what it all came down to. Yeah, absolutely. And it just reminds me real quick of something that was in the news recently. And actually, it had been a little bit in the news a little while back, but just a little less uh, prominently. There's the case of, I think, of Ancestry.com or uh, – no, well, I think it was Ancestry.com, too, uh, releasing uh, family tree information, but it was some of the companies that uh, will, you know, do genetic testing for you. And there were uh, some uh, cases of people's DNA being handed over to law enforcement for criminal cases and for other things uh, completely against the, the privacy agreements uh, stated uh, by the companies themselves. So this, you know, this, this covers so much beyond just email, even beyond electronics and the internet, uh, you know, the biometrics and your DNA are also at stake. Well, um, let's, let's kind of switch gears. People have got to start demanding strong cryptography for every piece of data that they think has any private amount whatsoever. They have to. That's really true. Literally any piece of data. I mean, not just that has any privacy. I mean, there's so, I think there are even little bits of what people perceive as harmless information about themselves that really isn't in this day and age. When you have the government, go ahead, Ladar. I was going to say, I think the real problem is that our government has become the greatest perpetrator when it comes to invasions of privacy. And the, the real problem is that it's happening every day, and most people never find out that it happened. Uh, the only way you really find out that your privacy was violated by our government was if they press charges against you in court. And odds are, if that's the case, then you're a criminal, and it's kind of hard to hold those people up as the examples. But if you take the innocent citizen, and there are a few examples of this, um, who through the courts managed to find out that they were placed under surveillance, you know, it's, it's really this feeling of being violated. And, you know, it, like I said, it's happening at a massive scale that most people don't even realize because it's all kept hush hush. I gotta say, I think you're totally right. And especially about the government being the largest perpetrator. And that gets right back to, the, in the legal, the courts, nobody's going to be out, they can outspend these guys. The only thing we can do as a group and a population is have strong cryptography and private keys managing all of our data. And that's, that's the only thing that's going to stem the tide at all that I can see. Yeah, I mean, you, you're... Oh, since the, the word crypto anarchy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Cypher punks rule. There you go. Well, and you're both right. Uh, they do rule. Hell yeah, especially with voices like that. Ladies, they all have deep, sultry voices like Barry White. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind you, next time you look, uh, look the other way when a cypherpunk or a nerd uh, gives you the eye because he might just be the hottest thing, not just at the computer, but the hottest thing in the bedroom. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. but you're both... <laughs> You're both right. Because I mean, the geeks are cool these days because they're all great kissers. That's true. That's Always true. Have, yeah. That's why I know Danny is not a geek. Wait, what? <laughs> what did I just say? No, but... Uh, How do you know that, Chris? What? But moving on. Anyway, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. But... Um, no, you're both right. Uh, you know, at it from the two sides of the coin, uh, it's one, the, qu the government needs to be scaled back in this regard. And on the flip side, we need to learn in every way possible to protect our data. And, you know, with, with the, the systems that the government has going where they can literally, uh, you know, with GPS read a sentence in a book that on a, you know, that you have holding up to the sky, they can, uh, pick you out in a crowd by your gate, the gate of your walk. They can, you know, just look at a, a quick, vague snapshot of your profile, uh, of your face and, and pick you out. There's, there's all, you know, they can, they can construct all sorts of, uh, 
things about what you do, where you go, based on little bits of information they glean from various uh, social media platforms and elsewhere. It's really important to, to preserve as much of your privacy as you can. Nothing, I mean, not to say that you literally have to be, you know, everything is secret or private, but, you know, consider that a lot of things should be. Well, you, I think you're exaggerating just a little bit on some of those examples, but uh, your premise is sound. I mean, surveillance is supposed to be difficult, and it's the difficulty that limits its scope. Um, if law enforcement has to choose who they're going to conduct surveillance on, then presumably they'll conduct surveillance only on criminals. And, and that was sort of the whole basis for the Fourth Amendment. It was supposed to put some obstacles in place um, where the government would have to go to a judge and prove that they had probable cause to suspect wrongdoing before they could invade somebody's privacy. And the problem is that the government um, has used modern technology to make that process um, completely obsolete. Uh, it's done in a matter of minutes using, you know, pre pro forma um, documents and, you know, judges are basically rubber stamping it. And that truly in and of itself probably isn't the real issue. The real issue is that it's happening so much and nobody can do anything about it because they don't, like I said, find out that their privacy was violated. How can you hold the system accountable if you don't know what it's doing? Well, exactly. And a lot of invasions of privacy are done uh, to get other information on you that is then admissible in court. They'll do what are either dubious or illegal uh, you know, acquisitions of information just to get more and without anyone's knowledge. They do that Parallel a lot of time. reconstruction. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But we'll talk more about that with uh, Ladar Levison and Cliff Baltzley here on the Crypto Show. Stay tuned, guys. We'll be right back after this break. Are you the plaintiff or defendant in a lawsuit? Win your case without an attorney with Jurisdictionary, the affordable, easy-to-understand 4-CD course that will show you how in 24 hours, step-by-step. If you have a lawyer, know what your lawyer should be doing. If you don't have a lawyer, know what you should do for yourself. Thousands have won with our step-by-step course, and now you can too. Jurisdictionary was created by a licensed attorney with 22 years of case-winning experience. Even if you're not in a lawsuit, you can learn what everyone should understand about the principles and practices that control our American courts. You'll receive our audio classroom, video seminar, tutorials, forms for civil cases, pro se tactics, and much more. Please visit ruleoflawradio.com and click on the banner or call toll-free 866-LAW-EASY. Good. Say it down with Big Brother. Down with Big Brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Big Brother was angry at first, but then he was like, oh. Then he, Soul. Then he liked it. He was like, I got warm tinglies. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, welcome back to the Crypto Show, guys, here on this lovely October 28th, 2015, here on Logos Radio Network, brought to you as always by. Uh, our sponsors, Brave New Books and Hill Country Home Improvements. And don't forget about the Zombie Ball coming up this Saturday, October 31st, Halloween, with Jim Mars as a very special guest and uh, judge of the costume contest. So check that out. And uh, we are talking with our guests, uh, Cliff Baltzley, founder of Hushmail, and uh, Ladar Levison, uh, founder of LavaBit. 
and uh, there's a lot we want to get into. Um, but before we get a little too sidetracked with what is, albeit very interesting stuff. Um, I do want to go ahead and give uh, each of them a chance to give us a rundown of what their uh, respective services uh, are and uh, how they worked. And uh, we'll start with uh, Cliff. Uh, give us just tell us a little bit about uh, Hushmail, uh, how you founded it, and, and Stash Crypto as well, because you know how that's coming along. Yeah, and we'll get into that as well for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, Stash is what I'm working on now, but when I did Hushmail. Um, that came straight out of after I had uh, uh, done a startup here um, called Ultimate Privacy. And um, while we were doing Ultimate Privacy, something called Hotmail came out. And that was kind of revolutionary in how easy it can be. So after I left Ultimate Privacy, I took the summer off. Did a little thinking, hanging out, nothing important. Drinking. Drinking, chilling, <laughs> all the good stuff. <laughs> and it just it literally occurred to me in a five-minute period of time when I was just thinking about what I'd done and hotmail at the same time. And I realized that you can absolutely make a web-based email system and protocol that is fully secure. Um, and it's it's in the short version. It's that for 20 years, people have called private keys, private and public keys, public. But if you have a good enough, strong enough passphrase, you can keep your private key out on the cloud. That's it. Boom. You've got web-based email that's fully solid and secure. As long as you know the code you're running in your browser is secure itself. And I have protocols and a patent, et cetera, that define that. And I wish, uh, I wish Hush would be using that now, unfortunately, because, well, wow, that's another story. But anyway. Well, and so uh, you said, so the private key could still be out on the cloud. Yeah. As long as the passphrase was secure enough. And can you explain that? Like, uh, how would you make the passphrase well, secure enough? Well, if your passphrase is of, uh, a long enough, has enough entropy, it's long enough and unique enough that the current state of affairs of computers cannot brute force it, then it's solid. The rest of it just comes into place. So kind of just like the, the private keys nowadays with Bitcoin. I mean, they're yeah. a huge string of of characters, capital uh -huh. and, and not capital, and it would be, you know, brute force take, you know, a million years or whatever yeah. to crack it under the existing level of technology. And so is is, so is the... Just to, just to cut you off there, pro tip for the listeners on how to pick a secure password. Um, typically, people think they need to pick one word and add a bunch of random characters to it. And the problem is those passwords are very difficult to remember. So one of the things that you could do to get a really strong password is to grab a dictionary, you know, preferably a paper one, and pick four words out of that dictionary and string them together. And as long as those four words are at least 20 characters or more, odds are you'll have a pretty strong password. Really? I mean, even with four, uh, like, known English words, that's still enough, generally speaking, to make it pretty secure? Yes, sir. It doesn't seem like, of course, it doesn't seem that way on the surface, but that's good to, that's kind of refreshing because yeah. that way it's. You, well, you, it can't be a couple of three, four letter words. It has to be, you know, words so of some substance. It can't be C-spot run is what you're saying. Oh, dang. <laughs> I was going to use NSA, TSA, yeah. FBI, you know, CIA. That's, that's why I said make sure the four words are at least 20 characters long. Odds right. are they'll be longer than that. Um, and, of course, the longer they are, the, the stronger it is. But think about how many words are there in English. You know, maybe 100,000 words in the average vocabulary. You know, take that to the fourth power, and that is your number of potential combinations. Yeah, and that's assuming you don't capitalize the first letter. Right, exactly. And, you know, Ladar, that's, that is a great way to do it. Unfortunately, with the um, just the power of computing, especially, it, it, let's just say if you're dealing with a major government situation to uh, brute force that situation, 
uh, we probably need six of those words or more just as a thought or, for our or listeners. Or perhaps your favorite SAT vocabulary list. Right. <laughs> like you said, pick five or six words off of that. Pro- probably a medical dictionary. You just need one word, and then that, should, the that should do it. What I'd like to remember is that it is possible for you to pick a strong password that is also easy to remember. You don't have to, you know, generate random strings of special characters in order to get a high security password. See, and that that's encouraging, I think, for your average kind of lay user because uh, I think it's uh, intimidating, you know, like if you have a Bitcoin private key and you want to say like cold store it or something, you know, writing it down somewhere where it could get stolen, you know, by somebody, even in the hard copy, or somehow you forget it and, you know, you, you can't remember something like that. In a way, your, your biggest storage, your safest storage is in your brain. If it's nowhere else, you know, that's your safest storage. So that's great. You know, that's a really good point for our listeners. Well, um, there's, there's uh, another tip. Uh, you could grab your favorite book off the bookshelf, flip to the page that corresponds to your birth year, and use the first line of text as your password. Then you don't uh, have to write it down anywhere. There you go. That's a, oh, that's interesting too. Yeah, that way the key is just it, there in your bedroom. Yeah, just, exactly. You're okay. just remembering what book. Right. Exactly. See, there's. I, the, you, typically, I typically use a password safe, but when I'm going up against, you know, say the FBI, and I have, I suspect that they're about to raid my apartment. Maybe I don't <laughs> want to keep, you know, my key stored on in that password safe because they could obviously install, you know, keyboard sniffers or something of that nature to capture it. Right, you don't want to give them any other evidence to infer that something might be your password. And uh, just one last comment before we switch gears. You know, some of the some of this uh, these tips harken back hundreds or thousands of years, where this sort of encryption, uh, as simple as it sounds, uh, has been used. You know, since ancient times, either by you know whether it's Greek generals or uh, you know secret societies or, or Caesar you know, or Caesar, the yeah, Caesar cipher. Caesar cipher. The Caesar cipher. I think there was a famous one where they like rolled it around uh, like an eight-sided uh, stick or something. And no, I don't it's, know if that... it's rotate thirteen. So you take the twenty-six character alphabet that we use, and you rotate each character by thirteen places. Oh, and there if you go. want extra security, you rotate it by thirteen characters twice. So in a pretty simple cipher, but uh, probably very difficult uh, for most to, to try to uh, decrypt. Well, uh, that's really cool stuff. We should have a, we should have a whole show on just like simple encryption, uh, you know, principles and devices and stuff like that. That'd be kind of fun uh, to do research on. Well, uh, getting back, um, so uh, with Hushmail, um, tell us was at at the time how common was. W- had your idea already been done? Uh, no, 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 no. It was it was groundbreaking. I mean, Phil Zimmerman did BGP, and that was the first for the public strong cryptography email system. Uh, It it wasn't really integrated so much with email as that you can encrypt any file and send it to your friend. It actually wasn't created specifically for email. It just happened that it was particularly useful for email. Right. Yeah. The problem with it was why I did Hushmail. Um, I tried to get probably 30 of my good friends to use BGP, and I could maybe get two or three. (laughs) It was too complicated once you're trying to describe what a public and a private key is and how you manage it and deal with it. They're lost. They need something like as simple as web-based email. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, even the concept of a public and private key can uh, be difficult for someone to really digest and understand. It, it takes a bit of just getting used to, but then managing it. I mean, that's a whole other story, a whole other right. level. And so it, it's great that you have services like this that bring it to the layperson. And so how successful was it? Uh, what direction did uh, did uh, Hushmail go in? And then what, what, what was your ultimate? Uh, well, it was a great, great time, time doing it. Um, you know, uh, we, from the day we started up until about 16 months in, we raised four rounds that totaled about, Ten million dollars, wow. and it was the dot com boom, and it was you know it was wild and wild times. It was cool, but the the I think we we had a number of problems. One is that we had to make a the U.S. company the parents, which 
uh, will get you where basically Hush Mill is now that as long as you uh, now they're mostly in Vancouver but you have to trust uh, you have to assume the Canadian government hasn't issued uh, a court order to see your email and if they do every piece of email that you've ever sent with anyone ever with a system is 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 open which you know I'm not worried about the Canadian government per se or any <laughs> government on my personal email but it's like you either use strong cryptography and you know it's secure or you just kind of hope because again like you said Chris <laughs> yeah. you won't know when people are reading your private data and that the world is is, is I hope eventually going to realize with enough problems as life goes on that you know what if you don't use strong cryptography with your own private key in a system then absolutely then where you might be screwed we'll be right back guys join the crypto show december 14th through 16th in sunny san diego california for inside bitcoins with some of the top names in bitcoin on the roster check out the details at insidebitcoins.com slash san dash diego dash 2015 or just click through on the banner ad at thecryptoshow.com. That's December 14th through 16th inside Bitcoins in San Diego. See you there. Can't be trusted. Can't be trusted. Government can't be trusted. True story. And the thing is, you know, it's... You, you, this song, you have to hear it live because she has a different version of it. When you hear it live, it's like... This, so this version is, oh, the TSA. But when it's live, it's, uh, you know, her middle finger's up in the air and it's F the TSA. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> I yeah. love it. Yeah, you've seen her live. Yeah, That's right. yeah. She's awesome. Does she... Wait, are they here in Austin? I forget. Uh, no, she's in L.A. It's uh, the Interrupters, and if you were a Ron Paul fan and you knew the Ron Paul uh, Revolution song, that's her. Yay. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, did they ever come to Austin? Awesome? Like this well, one here. We'll, we'll have to find out. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Good morning, America! Most people that are like Ron that. Paul fans know, yeah. That's the, That'd be the, fun the, to, to jog to. I might have to do, I'm trying to get <laughs> healthy again. I might have to do that. Well, um, welcome back to the Crypto Show, guys, here on uh, this lovely October 28, 2015, here on Logos Radio Network. Brought to you, as always, by our sponsors, Hill Country Home Improvements and Brave New Books. And we're talking to uh, Cliff Baltzley, of, uh, founder of Hushmail. And uh, we'll talk about some of his current stuff coming up. We're also talking to Ladar Levison, the creator of Lava Bit. And we'll talk about his newest venture coming up. And uh, before we get to Ladar, because I really want people to know his story. It's a really fascinating one. I do want to kind of wrap up with this uh, portion of of uh, uh, Cliff's story about Hushmail. Uh, apparently, he has a really interesting story to recount about some uh, goings-on that happened back in the day here in Austin. Uh, Cliff, go ahead. Oh, this is what happens when you talk between break. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll keep it incredibly short. Um, when we did Hushmail, uh, we did it as a non-U.S. company parent, but we had uh, server operations in Canada, Vancouver, and um, marketing operations here in Austin, down on 6th Street, just over on West 6th. And I think it was about five weeks after we announced and Wired did an article in CNET and et cetera, uh, the FBI came in and raided our offices and took all of our computers from uh, our downtown 6th Street office. And, um, well, you know, I didn't freak out. I was like, okay, well, hopefully they'll give them back and we'll just keep going. But if we were a U.S. company at that moment in time, I mean, we would have just been shut down. There, there was, as best as I can remember, no probable cause, no warrants, no anything. They just kind of came in, did their thing. 
And, you know, I, I always cooperate with law enforcement in a normal corporate world and environment. So um, everything was fine because a week later they gave all our equipment back. And about a week after that, we had a few um, agents from the FBI saying, you know what, that, uh, this whole uh, hush mill system is pretty neat. Okay. I'm like, well, I wonder if you guys put some bugs in our computers or something when you get it back. But, <laughs> Which maybe they did. I mean, for all we know. Yeah. I don't know. That's that, was know. The, that was the question I was going to ask. Did you trust the computers and keep using them when they got returned? I, I haven't trusted a computer that's plugged into the Internet for over a decade. Hey, man. So. <laughs> well, and real quick, well, why did they, they didn't give you any reason why they did it? or None. None. No. But, and so know. it was illegal as far as anyone can tell? Well, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I, it's just an interesting story, you know. So, well, to be sure, I, and, yeah. and this is happened before, where the, I mean, it's like I said, it's relatively easy for the FBI to get a warrant. They can take any particular facet of the operation and deliver in an affidavit that this is suspicious, and we think that you know when this behavior is going on, this criminal activity is usually also going on. They put that in an affidavit. They get the warrant. They seize all the equipment, and then they just sit on it in their warehouse. I mean, you were particularly lucky, Cliff, to get it back in just a week. I, so, I agree. I know, I know people here in Austin who had the same thing happen, ISBs. They never got their equipment back, and that was hundreds of thousands of uh, – it was Illuminati online. And I think that is so funny you itself. say that. So, I was thinking that actually yeah, when you were talking yeah, about it. They never got Because I knew the story back. of Steve Jackson's yeah. ISP, right. Illuminati Online, that had happened to him too. It's a very famous yeah. story. And I mean, again, the same thing where it's just like no apparent reason. Yeah. What well, people after the. Now we're post Patriot Act. We're in 2015. And it's, this is the late 90s. And this happens all over. Uh, it, it, it's a. Uh, Anyway, <laughs> well, and no, and, you know, that's enough said. I mean, read between the lines, but this is a great lead in, of course, to Ladar Levison in Lava Bit and what happened with him and Ladar. I mean, oh, I get chills just hearing about uh, Cliff's story. Of course, I got yeah. chills hearing about your story the first time. And I, I'm, I'm thrilled but scared to, to have you give another rundown. But tell us about your experience. Oh, such an open ended question. I'd say for the full <laughs> That's story, why I'm a radio host. To, you know, download the podcast from the last interview. But um, long story short, um, I built the encryption system back in 2004, which would protect a person's email once it arrived at our servers um, using their public key. And, of course, their private key would be protected by their password. And that private key would only be available while the user was connected to the server. And, of course, I relied on an industry standard called transport layer security to protect the data as it left uh, the RAM on the server and traveled through the wire down to the user's computer. And for 10 years, this sort of protected me from many of these moral quagmires. Now, this particular feature was only available to my paid users, which partially mitigated, um, you know, it ever becoming an issue in court. But lo and behold... 2013 comes along, and I have a user who's got this encryption feature enabled, and uh, the FBI really, really wants to read their mail. So they basically realize that the only way they're going to get that mail is by modifying the code on the server, or in this case, stealing the private key associated with the transport layer security so that they could basically imitate one of my servers to the internet and intercept wow. all of the connections. Think a game of telephone. And of course, when the agent said this, uh, I was a little bit, you know, dumbstruck. Um, I told them that I was uncomfortable with that um, because obviously as a developer and an information security expert, I knew what that meant. It meant that they were going to have to decrypt every single connection and inspect the data just to even figure out which ones were associated with the users or user or user that they were targeting. Um, and I told them I needed to consult with a lawyer. And of course, uh, before I even had a chance to pick up the phone and call a lawyer, 
they were back in court telling the judge that I wasn't cooperating. <laughs> and, you know, over the course of, That's you know, a whirlwind five or so weeks, um, you know, we went through this legal process where I tried to fight um, their request. And, of course, I lost. Um, so when I lost, I printed out the key and turned it over because they had maintained in all of their filings that this key was just information. Um, and that, you know, I needed to turn over this information to aid their investigation. Now, personally, I've come to believe that encryption keys are more like property and less like information, but that's just me. Anyways, um, I thought after pursuing me for five weeks that, you know, the least they could do, because this was a Friday, spend their weekend typing in this key, and that that would give me the time that I needed to gracefully shut down the servers and move all of the user data off to encrypted external hard drives. But you have to remember, back in the moment, I thought as soon as I shut down, they're going to show up at my door, they're going to arrest me, they're going to confiscate my servers. And the fact is, you know, of the 410,000 users I had, you know, only about 10,000 of them were using this encryption feature. Um, so I had about 50 million messages that were unprotected. And my big fear was that they were going to confiscate the servers and in an effort to protect the, the privacy of some of my users, I would end up causing the privacy of all my users to be, or large percentage of my users to be violated. So lo and behold, uh, they didn't, they decided they didn't want to type in the key. Um, they held me in contempt ex parte the following Monday. And, um, I drove out to the FBI field office here in Dallas and turned over the key on CD-ROM. But, of course, by the time I turned it over, the servers and service had already been shut down. So the hope at the time was that by shutting it down, they wouldn't be able to use the keys effectively. Now, if we could get into the characteristics of encryption, people who were using Internet Explorer, for example, if their sessions had been recorded, there's a chance the key could have decrypted those connections after the fact, which is why this thing that we talk about called perfect forward secrecy is so important. But that's a story for another day. Well, and so what, what did happen with your servers? Did, did they seize them once you had shut it down or no? No. Um, I got lucky. Um, I, I will credit the FBI with one thing. Um, they had a search warrant which would have allowed them to raid uh, my home office and my data center in search of this this key, but they at least respected me enough to know that I didn't leave it sitting around anywhere un unencrypted. <laughs> um, so I never did get raided. Um, they never did seize the servers, and I think they contemplated filing charges against me possibly for obstruction of justice wow. or possibly contempt of court charges for the letter that I posted on my website after the shutdown. Um, but the story sort of caught wind in the media so quickly that I think that afforded me a certain degree of protection. And, and why would they have uh, arrested you or charged you for the letter? Was it in violation of a gag order or something, or what was the issue with that? So the way the law is written, you're not allowed to admit you've even received one of these pen register trap and trace orders. Um, <laughs> or a five or ridiculous. any of these other yeah. mechanisms, right? it and by shutting down and saying that I was engaged in a legal fight in the Fourth Circuit, I wasn't admitting that I had received a letter specifically, but I was admitting that something had been received and that I was engaging in some sort of legal battle uh, that I obviously at the time couldn't tell anybody about. And it would be several months before any of the details would be unsealed. And, you know, of course, there's still a handful of things that I can't talk about. Right. Well, you know, just it's it's so bizarre. It sounds surreal, like something made up out of a. St it sounds like Franz Kafka is the trial. I don't yeah. know if either of you's ever read well, that book, but it's sad that in the United States of America that this kind of stuff is occurring. I mean, uh, I, I just can hope that as time goes on, people will stand up for their constitutional rights, the Bill of Rights, and their personal. You know, freedom and rights within the system. Um, because, well, and, the, I, and I think Ladar's right. It's because the media took hold of the story that 
they realized it's um it, it's it's a losing battle. Ladar's closing the company anyway. By the way, Ladar, I have a lot of respect for you for what you did. In As do we all, absolutely. Well, let, went- let's just be clear, right? Technically, the service is suspended. <laughs> the company does still exist. Um, and we will and hopefully will re- be resurrected. And of course, we can talk about that in the next segment. And we will definitely America. talk about that in the next segment. Ladar is good at those segues too. I like that, but transitions between the subjects. Well, uh, we're talking to Ladar Levison, uh, founder of LavaBit, and Cliff Baltzley, founder of Hushmail. And we'll talk about some of the new stuff they're doing here soon. So stay tuned to the crypto show, guys. We'll be right back. Letters or even lawsuits. Stop debt collectors now with the Michael Miris Proven Method. Michael Miris has won six cases in federal court against debt collectors, and now you can win, too. You'll get step-by-step instructions in plain English on how to win in court using federal civil rights statutes, what to do when contacted by phone, mail, or court summons, how to answer letters and phone calls, how to get debt collectors out of your credit report, how to turn the financial tables on them and make them pay you to go away. The Michael Miris Proven Method is the solution for how to stop debt collectors. Personal consultation is available as well. For more information, please visit ruleoflawradio.com and click on the blue Michael Miris banner or email Michael Miris at yahoo.com. That's ruleoflawradio.com or email M-I-C-H-A-E-L-M-I-R-R-A-S at yahoo.com to learn how to stop debt collectors now. This is... The Logos, Logos Radio Network. time don't touch that no i'm just kidding <laughs> cliff was can't reaching for this. can't touch this <laughs> no cliff was <laughs> cliff was uh well uh moving on uh, doing again? <laughs> i don't remember i'm like i'm in and out of consciousness during the show a lot of the times the time, something like that <laughs> well speaking of which for our Let's Talk Bitcoin listeners, LTB, uh, we always have the magic word, and sometimes we like to mix it up and not do it in the last segment, but throw it in somewhere random. And the magic word is... Dime Stash. One more time. The magic word is... Dime Stash. Oh, yeah. I like that one. And it would be D-I-M-E-S-T-A-S-H. They have to actually spell it correctly to get. Oh, okay, good. Where's my dime stash? Well, we're, we're, I don't know, but if I had some hash coins, I think I would probably <laughs> buy some of that dime stash. Uh, wah. Good hey, for you. You got to share, so maybe you need a little more than a dime. <laughs> That's true. Well, and speaking of dime stash, that was supposed to be an amalgamation of sorts of the two current projects of our guests. And Ladar, I'm going to have you explain why. Uh, we used Dime Stash. So Dime uh, stands for the Dark Internet Mail Environment, and you could almost think of Dime as PGP Next. Uh, so Cliff sort of mentioned earlier in the broadcast how difficult it is to use PGP. So what I sort of undertook uh, in conjunction with the guys at Silent Circle after my service shut down was a project to make the end-to-end encryption that we get with a technology like PGP or S-MIME, automatic trans- and transparent so that hopefully in the future it can become ubiquitous. And that's what I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, this Four of the five specs have been uh, relatively stable for the last year or so, and I have a team working on implementing those. And the last spec, uh, which is the access protocol, the IMAP replacement for manipulating the encrypted data, um, is almost done as well. So really what I'm trying to do is create a system that makes the type of encryption that you got with something like Hushmail 
or in the case of LavaBit, was being performed on the server and create a protocol framework which will allow your client to do all of that encryption for you without any kind of intervention by you, the user. Um, because Cliff is right, you really need a PhD in computer science in order to understand how PGP works and how cryptography works. And, you know, it's just unfortunate because even people with PhDs in computer science can't seem to figure it out. So, <laughs> Some of them. you know, if, if they can't use it, you know, how is the journalist or the doctor or the lawyer supposed to figure it out? Or the and, FBI or the NSA, exactly. Or the dark market uh, guy. <laughs> <laughs> so what I said about doing was really taking, I mean, cryptographically speaking, uh, DIME is PGP using ECC. I mean, if you're familiar with, with RFCs, Zoom um, I, looked it up, <laughs> I looked it up a second ago, but it's, I think it's 6611 um, is the RFC that defines how to use PGP with um, elliptical curve cryptography. And we're basically taking the best elements of that and we're creating a framework around that which will allow people to exchange encrypted messages securely um, without any intervention by the user. And presumably the goal of this system is to create a framework that will allow users who are so inclined to take back control over the privacy of their email simply by upgrading their email client software. Wow, that's pretty incredible, uh, it, and that sounds like a really robust and, and secure uh, new service. And so just to be clear, this is the resurrection of LavaBit. So the, the plan, and it's, it's been the plan for a while now, is that when um, I have a mature, stable, audited, and secure dark mail implementation, I plan to deploy it on LavaBit.com and resume operations. And with any luck, that will be early sometime in 2016. Wow, that's coming up. I mean, it's already late. Uh, it's already October 2015. Uh, that's only a few months away. That's pretty exciting. And, of course, it's going to be dark mail. And uh, so the DIME, is that your uh, proprietary uh, uh, acronym you came up with, or is that an industry uh, f uh, phrase? Well, I, I did trademark it, and... You know, the, the idea is that we'll set up a framework where uh, DIME-compatible implementations can get audited, and presumably if they're doing what they're supposed to with regards to encryption and protection of user data, they'll be allowed to use that trademark. Um, oh, so it's kind of like a, a licensing uh, yeah, program, so if essentially? Yeah, familiar with the Federal Information Protection Standard, um, they have different audit levels, one through four, and a cryptographic implementation can go through the audit process and assuming it passes all of the criteria can claim that they are, you know, FIPS level one or FIPS level four. And we'll probably set up something similar uh, for dark mail implementations in the distant future. I mean, this is way down the roadmap, obviously. But the, the goal is to take these standards and right now they live at darkmail.info and submit them as a series of RFCs to the IETF so that they can eventually become an Internet standard. And is, is FIPS related to FISA, or is that different? No, no FIPS stands for the Federal Information Protection Standard, and it's the set of regulations, guidelines, and standards that are used uh, by the federal government to protect sensitive and or classified information. I just so, want to say that the FISA... Mm -hmm is also used to protect us under the uh, no. No, I, I'm just kidding. What does W have to say? There's an old <laughs> saying in Tennessee. I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. If fool me, we can't get fooled again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be a goofball, but I was obviously being facetious. That's definitely not the case with FISA. Uh, Have you ever noticed how George Bush and Roscoe P. Coltrane just kind of look and act Roscoe so much alike? Wait, are you talking about like, uh, wait, who? Uh, Roscoe Dukes of from the Dukes of oh, Hazzard. Oh, I'm not that old, guys. I'm sorry. No, uh, I'm, no, I mean, <laughs> no I'm 30, I'm almost 34, actually. I'm not that young. But uh, no, I forgot. That's right. No, I can I can see the similarity, yeah. actually. <laughs> well, no, and, and uh, but anyway, getting back on a more serious note, uh, that sounds really exciting, Ladar. Um, 
And uh, I think a lot of people are going to benefit from this once this gets going. Um, so uh, we're, you're hoping for a launch in early 2016. Um, I know it's not, uh, you know, uh, all ventures in this life take uh, time and money. And uh, I know if people wanted to, they could uh, also contribute to the ongoing effort to get this rolled out as quickly as possible. Is that right? Yeah, so uh, darkmail.info, there's a mailing list you can sign up for if you want to be notified when dark mail services are available for, you know, public registration. And you could also download the spec. Uh, there's also a donation link. Uh, the thing we need most right now are highly skilled programmers and the money to pay for them. Well, excellent. Well, we're hoping that with, uh, you know, somewhere through our listenership or the, the network of guests, so uh, we can... Uh, help kickstart that for you and uh, get people on board in that regard. So, uh, yeah, I keep hearing how, you know, robust and, and big the, you know, Austin tech community is. So it, I mean, it really is. It's like a second Silicon Valley, by the way, speaking of which, do, does either of y'all watch Silicon Valley? Yeah. Hmm. What? Cliff is shaking his head. No, what? It's, it's too real. Really? Well, I can the understand Silicon that. Valley premiered, I think a month after I moved out into a large house here in the Dallas area, um, filled with computer programmers, that we were all working on the dark mail project. What? So, <laughs> what? I mean, it literally debuted right as we were doing exactly what they were doing on the show. This, um, is Mike Judge your next door neighbor? Set of dramatic stories to tell uh, um, from from that little adventure in in living in a hacker house. But uh, do you really? Because that would be a fun episode. And Just in, the talking first about episode, in the first episode, right, there was a Texas reference. Uh, they brought up Campbell's suit and how it was based in Texas. And I couldn't help but thinking they were talking about us. Wow. You never know. Uh, I'm going to have to think about that. Maybe there's some encoded uh, reference there. No, but that's really bizarre. Art imitates life. Life imitates art, right? And Mike Judge is from Texas. So Hell yeah. he probably, who knows, maybe he's, he knows about you guys and he's using it as inspiration for the show. It's a great show. Uh, Silicon Valley, check it out. I think it's HBO. Uh, it'll be in its third season soon. But anyway, we're talking with Ladar Levison and Cliff Balsley here on the Crypto Show. Still got a couple more segments, so stay tuned, guys. We will be right back after this break. Hey, it's Danny here for Hill Country Home Improvements. Did your home receive hail or wind damage from the recent storms? Come on, we all know the government caused it with their chemtrails, but good luck getting them to pay for it. Okay, I might be kidding about the chemtrails, but I'm serious about your roof. That's why you have insurance, and Hill Country Home Improvements can handle the claim for you with little to no out-of-pocket expense. And we accept Bitcoin. As a multi-year A-plus member of the Better Business Bureau with zero complaints, you can trust Hill Country Home Improvements to handle your claim and your roof right Right the first time. Just call 512-992-8745 or go to hillcountryhomeimprovements.com. Mention the crypto show and get $100 off. And we'll donate another $100 to the Logos Radio Network to help continue this programming. So if those out-of-town roofers come knocking, your door should be locking. That's 512-992-8745 or hillcountryhomeimprovements.com. Discounts are based on full roof replacement. May not actually be kidding about chemtrails. You're listening to the Logos Radio Network at logosradionetwork.com. I've been walking a tightrope between fact and fiction. Been wrestling with demons in small bottle prisons. Been talking to sinners who claim to be Christian. Been shouting at leaders who claim. All right, guys, welcome back to the final two segments of the Crypto Show here on this lovely October 28th, 2015, a Wednesday before this Saturday Halloween, uh, during which time we will have the zombie ball at Brave New Books, who also happens to be one of our sponsors. And Jim Mars, New York Times bestselling author, will be there uh, probably for (laughs) a talk and a book signing. Uh, and uh, also to judge the zombie ball itself. And don't forget, Hill Country Home Improvements are our other sponsor. And uh, that was speaking gone. of scary places. Speaking of scary places. How about that Silicon Valley, man? I know. Well, speaking of which, uh, you know, uh, Ladar had an interesting comment in a just a brief uh, story to make about uh, Silicon Valley, a sort of, uh, 
I don't know, warning, if you will. But uh, Ladar, uh, uh, get into that real quick. Well, the the history of Silicon Valley is really interesting. It really got going after World War II when the head of MIT's uh, radar research lab moved out to California and set up um, a DARPA-funded lab at Stanford University. And over the subsequent 20, 30, 40 years, many of the people who worked in that program would leave and and create technology-related startups, usually based on technology that was developed under a DARPA grant. And that's sort of how we ended up with Intel. Um, Apple Computer, of course, has its own origin story, uh, but Ampex, you know, all of these early technology companies springing up uh, between San Francisco and San Jose. I actually grew up in the Bay Area, and I I remember distinctly, you know, driving down the 101 and seeing these signs growing up. So I actually find it somewhat interesting that, you know, back when I was growing up, all the technology companies were down in Silicon Valley, and Nobody really operated out of San Francisco proper, and of course now it's it's sort of shifted a little bit. But uh, if we if we're wondering why Silicon Valley has such a close relationship with the government, it's because so many of those big tech companies started as DARPA projects, including the internet, by the way. Yeah, I was I was just going to mention the internet itself was a, a an outgrowth of Stanford and DARPA. <laughs> Uh, you know, or the World Wide Web was a uh, creation of CERN, an, an intergovernmental uh, entity of its own. Uh, and uh, this really could not be emphasized enough. I, I, I made a similar point without the specifics uh, a few episodes back that, you know, of course, there's plenty of people out there who are independent uh, tech guys like the like our guests, like Ladar Levison, like uh, Cliff Baltzley, like a lot of people we've had on. Uh, and there's independent tech guys who work for these big Silicon Valley firms. Which but, is, by the way, over 125 people we've already had on. <laughs> so, wow, already? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Five, it's five cubed. Very that's cool. pretty good. Well, um, I'm, so, I'm amazed that we've had enough people tolerate us for up to a couple <laughs> hours. But, uh, but no, you know, it really can't be emphasized enough that uh, the history of, of technology in this country uh, is to some extent the history of government uh, involvement, direction, funding, uh, et cetera. And so you have to be really careful when uh, you get these big uh, tech companies uh, trying to push for, you know, accessing your private information and pushing certain things on you. Uh, and that's why we need uh, services like uh, hush mail or the resurrected lava bit, dark mail or, or dime, uh, because uh, we can't trust some of these big corporations. And it's not just, just because they're big that we can't trust them. It's because a lot of them have been in bed in one way or another with the government. So I think that's a really so important point. It, it's interesting to, that you bring this up because if we really want to get into the history, the history of telecom is even darker. Uh, yeah, Bell you know, Labs. The, the Bell Labs and the and the CEO of AT and T sitting down, you know, with um, I, I forget who it was, if it was the director of the FBI or not, and you know, agreeing to aid them in their surveillance efforts back when, you know, telegraphs and the telephone system were like the only ways of communicating in real time. And what's interesting is that as in bed as some of the big tech giants are they're relatively good compared to telecom. Um, <laughs> wow. Telecom has literally been married to law enforcement and intelligence agencies since the Bell system was created. Um, and there's, there's a whole other history there. Where Silicon Valley gets a bad rap is we'd have to look at one of the biggest tech companies out there. And if you really dig into the history of their CEO, he's basically – an ambassador um, for the U.S. government. I mean, he's literally served as an ambassador to North Korea. And, you know, his his girlfriend sits on the, you know, World Foreign Affairs Council or something like that. You know, so th- him personally has a very close relationship with members in the highest, at the highest levels of government. So it makes sense that they would be, be cooperating. But a lot of that history and a lot of those relationships are really buried beneath the surface unless you know what to look for. 
Yeah, and, uh, and that's the thing. They're buried beneath the surface, not necessarily literally suppressed, although that's probably true in many cases. But, you know, if, if it's not on someone's radar, it might as well not exist. Uh, it might as well not as, uh, exist. And so that's the case for a lot of Americans. But so, That sounds kind of like a warning for Bitcoin right now is the, the marriage that they're trying to have with all these three-letter agencies. Maybe the people in Bitcoin well, should take a look at that before they... Absolutely, and we had, uh, I want to get uh, Cliff's uh, comment on some of this stuff here in a second, but we had on Bruce Fenton and uh, Christian Blaze uh, last show to talk about, well, Christian was talking about his cool uh, project, which was uh, Death Row Democracy, a film project using Bitcoin. Check that out, deathrowdemocracy.com, deathrowdemocracy.bit. But we had Bruce Fenton on to talk about the Blockchain Alliance uh, an organization of which he was very skeptical uh, and considering that he knew a lot of the people in that organization on the Bitcoin side, you know, he was rather alarmed that a lot of these well-meaning people were sort of blithely just going, you know, going along with this organization that's basically this interface between uh, the blo- the Bitcoin community and law enforcement. Uh, but, um uh, and so that, let that be a warning to, yeah, the Bitcoin community, Bitcoin developers, et cetera, because you just don't I, – I, I, don't, I don't care how well-intentioned you are. Uh, I don't care how much good you're doing for encryption and Internet security and Bitcoin and whatever. It, you know, getting involved with the, the feds or law enforcement is just a risky game. But anyway, Cliff, I want to get some of your thoughts on, on, on all that. Um, that's a lot of topics. Uh, let, let me hit the uh... – fast overview then people in bitcoin people in cryptography people who want to have their privacy when they do things online um it it almost reminds me now that we have the latest star wars coming out if you saw the last three well we've got the emperor running both sides of the game and everyone thinks they're the right in the right and doing all of what they're doing and what everyone's doing is not looking at what is right in front of them. The only way that people can have a free internet of autonomy and liberty is if you have cryptographic strong security that you can see all of your code all the way down and um, that's implemented and especially in a decentralized manner. That's so important. If, if You know what? Of all the causes you want to give money to, find something that meets that and give them 20 bucks for a yeah. pound. You know, if that happens, that will change the next 10 years more than any one case or any one issue or anything else. Because it's the technology from the databasing and everything else of surveillance that's going to put this into a North Korea a type of world faster than anyone can imagine versus decentralized strong security and cryptography no absolutely well said uh cliff's got a really good way of summing things up and it's like basically take that brief set of criteria and if a, a company or group matches it then that's where your money should go you know, uh, really let's, let's so, take uh, the la- like last minute now. let's take the last minute or so here before we come into the the next break and uh, let Cliff explain what Stash Crypto is. Well, actually, why don't we uh, no? let's get into it. Why don't we save that for the next segment? I was just going to say okay. that exactly. You know, building on what Cliff was saying, that it's actually a, a much trickier issue um, than we let on. You know, it would be nice that ev- if everybody could use cryptography to protect their information. But the real problem is this slippery slope because as Americans, You know, we want to help law enforcement catch the bad guys. We like that nobody breaks into our apartment, but our car is usually where we left it. And it's hard to figure out when is law enforcement stepping over that line and when are they not. And, you know, of course, both me and Cliff have lived through that in, you know, the real world, having to make these decisions about do we cooperate, do we not cooperate, because there's no guidebook. Never um, surrender. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's a really good point. Uh, and we're coming to break with Ladar Levison of Dark Mail and uh, Cliff Balsley of uh, uh, Stash, which we'll talk about in the next segment. And it's a really good point. Stay tuned, guys.
All right, welcome back to the final segment of the Crypto Show, guys, here on October 28th, 2015. Here on Logos Radio Network, brought to you as always by Brave New Books and Hill Country Home Improvements. We're talking with Ladar Levison, founder of LavaBit, which will soon be reincarnated as uh, Dark Mail. Uh, Guess who? <laughs> and uh, Cliff Baltzley, founder of Hushmail, and uh, also uh, one of the guys working on something called Stash. We'll talk to him in just a, a second about that. Uh, that's a, a, a project also of Chris Odom of Open Transactions, who's been on the show actually a couple times already. Uh, he's a really cool guy as well. We have so many interesting, intelligent people. I love it. Uh, you know, that's the only reason I, that's the primary reason why I love doing the show. It's certainly not, uh, being in the same room as Danny. Cause that's just, <laughs> that's just irritating. <laughs> but, um, no, uh, I wasn't joking, <laughs> but uh, I just, <laughs> that was good. I just want to make the point though, kind of uh, following along with what Cliff and Ladar were saying is, you know, you, you really got to be suspect of, of. The, the broader world. I mean, there's there's hackers, there's the government, there's corporations out to get your information. Silicon Valley has been in bed with the government for a long time. As Ladar pointed out, uh, in part because the technology uh, preceded uh, stuff that came out of Silicon Valley, uh, telephony and telegraphy uh, have been in bed with the government even longer. You know, think AT&T, Bell Labs, et cetera. And Western so, Union. Western Union, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a great example. And, you know, as Ladar was saying, the purported purpose of law enforcement is to get the bad guy. But one of the issues with that, is, as Bruce Fenton pointed out in the last episode, is who is the bad Who's guy? the bad guy? Exactly. But one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. Amen. Amen. It's exactly you know, the point we try to make here on the show. And Ladar summed it up. And especially I wish if, you, especially if you're that. laying in a hospital with a broken toe and they decide to bomb it. Oh, you mean, yeah. In the, yeah, I know, in the, the <laughs> Doctors Without Borders. You know, We're the good guys. I'm not surprised that Ladar gets it or Cliff gets it. They're smart guys, and they've, they've uh, you know, actually experienced firsthand the, the evils of what the government can do, and they're tech guys who work in security and, and, and privacy matters. But I wish I'm, more... I'm one of those people who really enjoyed college, and amongst the four degrees that I got, one of them was political science. So... You know, I really understand both how technology meets politics and the law, and it's just one of these situations where, in a democracy, we're supposed to hold our government accountable. And when we don't know what our government is doing, how can we be expected to hold them accountable? And that's really exactly. why the system of protections has broken down in such a dramatic fashion over the last 20 years. That's exactly. Why, that's why I am voting for these nuts. <laughs> a secret government will only end up in one really bad way, and we're going down that right now, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's sad, too, because everything started with good intentions and then got married to this thing called time, only to become the personification of evil. Um, you know, Is that your passphrase, what you just said there? <laughs> That's a good <laughs> word. I, I have about 130 different passphrases, so... I think ubiquitous um, was one too that you used earlier. No, you know, it's fashionable to hate the NSA, but if you really know the history, the NSA was created with the mandate to prevent another Pearl Harbor. And after 9/11, they decided that in order to fulfill their mandate, they had to spy on the whole world. They're going. Well, they're going to stop something they created. <laughs> I know, right? Well, that's a whole can of worms. Uh, it reminds me, there's a good book by George Morgenstern that was published in 1947 about Pearl Harbor. I recommend people read. But, you know, good intentions are not uh, what the creature has become is pretty monstrous. And that's, you know, the main thing. Isn't there, isn't there something about the road to hell being paved with? Paved with yeah. good intentions, exactly. Well, let's uh, quickly switch gears because I want to uh, let uh, Cliff Balsley talk about a recent venture he's been working on. It's called Stash, and it's something he's been doing with uh, Chris Odom, who's been a guest on the show uh, two or three times. And he was a guest like two or three times in a small 
span. It was kind of cool. He's a great guy. He's really funny, very smart, uh, like most of our guests. And he taught us how to pick up chicks. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, that too. That's uh, that was such a cool well, thing. I mean, he's happily married now, so he's just gonna pass on his knowledge. That's how it is. Yeah, so just to help yeah. other guys. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Well, aside from that kind of knowledge, uh-huh. tell us about the knowledge involved in stash. What's going on there? Well, I mean, Chris and I, we had a lot of background on this, and this. Um, um, this is, I think, the cypherpunk dream. This is where we can take what the amazing thing that Bitcoin and blockchain technology is and marry it into a real-world situation so that there will never be another Mount Gox. There will never be another situation where people are using funds where one single business entity can steal or lose or get hacked. All of Whatever money. the case may be. Exactly. <laughs> we, we don't care what their story is. We know we lost our money. Okay. Well, we've got a system that solves that problem. Um, and we're working furiously. There's just five of us here in Austin going for it. I'm the only business guy aside, but we've got four awesome developers working on this. And um, we're out trying to raise money and get more developers and get our first product out, which... We're actually going to be demoing at the show comp, um, that Chris Odom is, is speaking at tomorrow in Las Vegas. Oh, cool. Yeah, he's, he's an awesome speaker. In fact, he's, he, he's our in-house celebrity for just being an awesome speaker and fully promoting this stuff, which is why I'm sitting here sounding like Darth Vader. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> you would be an awesome speaker, too, because you're articulate, eloquent, a smart guy, and you actually, despite the sound effect, that sound effect is not far off from his actual voice. He has this deep, silky radio voice. He really does, and we're uh, you know privileged to be probably one of the few people who will ever hear it in person. Well, this is the only radio show I have ever done, and um, well, there you go, Danny. Suck oh. it, CNBC. Yeah. <laughs> Damn straight. Well, Cliff Balsley gives a an open ended, unconditional, absolute endorsement of the crypto show. He loves it. It's called the crypto show. Come on. Need I say anything more? Exactly. But you know, still, like, uh, I think he would be a great speaker too. But Chris Odom, I have to admit, you know. Uh, now that I've met you, I know four out of the five people on your team. And uh, Chris, though, I had only recently met when he was on the show in the past few weeks or whatever yeah, it's been. Three weeks ago, we got a nice link on our website. Stash Crypto. Was it three um, weeks ago? I think it was. God, it I mean, feels like an eternity. Sometimes it, it like feels like forever. Yeah. <laughs> Dealing with that guy, yeah. am I right? <laughs> That's it. No, but like uh, I, I, to do research for the show uh, to get ready for him to come on, like I watched uh, him give some talks, and he's really good. And yeah. I imagine his experiences in other things helped with that you know it's all about talking and social interaction uh but he was really good at uh what i liked about chris odom is uh pretty down to earth but also he was really good at uh knowing his audience in the sense of knowing when to throw in a layman's explanation for something yeah uh, which was pretty cool but anyway i'm not i'm not here to like kiss his butt no, or something he's great i mean 100 uh, percent i'm, I'm- I'm just happy we met. We met at um, John's Bitcoin conference here. In I'll Austin tell us about, about when years. you guys met. Yeah, we, when we met, we had a little nice honeymoon. It was beautiful. <laughs> well, I'm so well, happy it's, for you guys. nice to hear that people are still meeting in real life and not just on dating websites. <laughs> no, no. It's not Tinder all the way. <laughs> Ladar, it's rare, but it does happen, I swear. <laughs> Bitcoin Tinder. Well, um, real right. quick, we I was going to say Chris Odom's an interesting person to bring up just because there's been so much talk around him and, and being a Swiss company. You know, do we want to talk about what it's like to be an American citizen working for a foreign company and sort yeah. of the effect of law on that? Or are we out of time? Got to save it. We got three time. minutes left. Yeah. Let's quickly do that. And in the last, you know, 30 seconds, two uh, minutes. three minutes, I think maybe we need to save it. <laughs> well, and that's, yeah, well, you know- let me give you the 60 second teasers so people will know what they're getting next time. <laughs> One of the issues that came up after I suspended operations for my service was that if I moved my servers to Switzerland, where privacy laws are very stringent, in fact, in in Switzerland, it is actually against the law to reveal a customer's private information without an order from the Swiss High Court. 
Um, I would have been put in this awkward position as an American, presumably still living in the United States, where I could be served with something that would force me to choose between violating U.S. law and violating Swiss law. So a catch-22, whichever way you go, you're going to be charged by one government or the other, yeah. So it, it's an interesting problem that companies are, are having to face, and everybody kind of has their eye on a on a Microsoft case right now where the government is trying to get Microsoft to turn over data that's technically on, on servers in Ireland. And, you know, of course, the judge thinks he has jurisdiction over the entire planet, and, of course, Microsoft <laughs> says, oh, you need to get an order in Ireland for an Irish user living in, you know, whose data is in Ireland. And, of course, this is- the Irish government agrees. And this is where we're at now. We've got five of us here in Austin. Um, you know, this, I, I lived in Anguilla for a year and Dublin for almost a year. Um, Chris was in Switzerland for a year. You know, at the end of the day, if you make a corporation that's not based in the U.S., that you can be anywhere and it's a decentralized system, especially if it's open source, go for it, you know. Absolutely. Well, Yes, but I mean, what the the real issue is that if you as an American have access to those servers, when you yeah. cross into U.S. jurisdiction, as in, you know, and if you're living here, you're always in U.S. jurisdiction unless you're traveling abroad. Very you true. Know, they can serve you with one of these orders and make you log into this server remotely and pull the data. Right. So, well, you know, what I would have had to do is not only move my servers there, but I would have had to move to Switzerland. And unfortunately, I don't speak French or German. Um, <laughs> which would have made life a little bit... A little bit more difficult. Well, and sorry sorry to interrupt, Ladar. we got 30 seconds. Ladar Levison, we want to have you back. We'd love to have you back. We didn't get enough into uh, more of your story with LavaBit, although there is an archive show about it. Ladar, quickly, uh, where can people go for uh, Darkmail? Darkmail Darkmail.info. There's a forum, there's a mailing list you can sign up, and of course, a donation link. Cliff Stash? stashcrypto.com hey Danny you want to say that in a real voice thank you stashcrypto.com right, thank you so much guys you've been great guests we'll see you all next time guys